All right, well, we come now to chapter 12 in the book of Romans, which, as you know, marks a turning point in the letter, Paul's letter to the Romans. Until now, he's been explaining the gospel, and he has been applying it, but in a more general way. Uh, we do need to remember that uh, this church was started by a group of Jews um, from Rome who were converted on the day of Pentecost. And while they were there, they were discipled for a short time, and then they returned home and planted a church, and they began the work of the Great Commission. Paul wrote this letter to complete that discipleship and to encourage them in the faith, uh, praying and hoping by God's grace that he would be able to come to them soon. But in case he wasn't able to, they would have this letter, which would also be very helpful. And we are very thankful that he wrote this letter because I think it has been one of the greatest blessings God has given to his church. But having explained the gospel, he now turns more specifically to application. As I said, he's been applying the gospel in a more general way as he's explored the different aspects of it. But now he turns to a more specific and practical, I should say, more specific and practical ways that we should apply the gospel to our lives so that we may adorn the gospel and prove its truths not only to ourselves but also to others. You know, as we see our lives being transformed, it proves to us that the gospel is true. And of course, if the world sees no difference between us and them, they're not going to accept it either. And they'll say, why should I receive Christ? doesn't make any difference to you. Well, the way the gospel is vindicated, the way that it's proved is through a transformed life, and that's what this is all about. Now, what Paul does in our text this morning is he begins by summarizing that the duty that we have, what the gospel calls us in general to be. He tells us in verse 2 how to carry this out. Generally, what do we have to do in order to accomplish this? And then he begins to unpack it in the remainder of the chapter and through the rest of the letter. So this morning, we're, we are going to, by, by God's grace, tackle uh, everything we see in Romans 12. And because we are taking so much, I'm not going to repeat every verse or draw our attention to, okay, now I'm addressing this particular section. But hopefully you'll see how this all unfolds by you know, familiarity with uh, Romans chapter 12. So he begins with the summary. And this is a verse that uh, all of us really should memorize because it's a summary of everything the Lord wants us to do. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What does the Lord want us to do? Everything he wants us to do really is contained in this verse. Now, first of all, he points back to what he has just explained, the mercies that God has shown us. Now, here, here again is one of the downsides of our taking so long to go through the letter is that by the time we reach this point, we've forgotten what he said. You know, these things are no longer fresh in our minds. So I just want to briefly restate what some of these mercies are. And this in no way does justice to what Paul has said. So we were condemned. We came into this world on our way to hell, to everlasting misery. Not just because Adam sinned as our covenant head and condemned all of us, made us all guilty, but also because coming into this world with a sinful heart, we saw God's existence and tried to bury it with our intellect. And we knew what he wanted us to do in our consciences, but we disregarded it. And we did what we wanted to do. But God, Paul has told us, in eternity before he founded the world because of his love for us, chose us and sent his son for us while we were still his enemies to redeem us by taking the judgment that was due to us on himself and carrying away our sins. He also gave to us his spirit to change our hearts and to make us willing to trust Him, whereas we hated Him before, now we love Him. Through faith, He has grafted us into the church, 
into the covenants. Remember the olive tree, the covenants he made with Israel. And now we are the people of God. We were aliens and strangers without hope, without God in the world. But now we've been brought near, no longer aliens and strangers, but his people sharing in the promises God made to Israel. And, of course, one of the greatest blessings is this. Now that we belong to him, there is nothing in heaven or earth that can ever separate us from his love. So we are secure in Christ. And if there's anything that the Reformation series has reminded us of, it is that very point. Now that the Lord has brought us to himself and put us in his family, he will never kick us out of his family. Now, based on these many mercies, Paul now urges us, he begs us, to do something in return. And that is to offer ourselves to him. Salvation is free, you've heard, and, and it is free. It is the gift of God's free grace. But remember, it will cost us everything we have because it demands our whole lives. Now, unlike the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament, which, of course, were put to death and then often, not always, but often burned to ashes, right? we are to give ourselves as living and holy sacrifices to God. Those who set themselves apart to Him to live entirely for His glory alone. So this, this is what the gospel calls us to do. This is what the love of God calls us to do. And this is what the love He gives to us in our hearts is compelling us to do, to give ourselves to Him in this way. Now, Paul gives us a couple of practical things to do in order to accomplish this in verse 2. First, he says, we need to take our eyes off of this world. Okay, when John, you know, what John tells us in, in 1 John chapter 2, that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. And if we love the world, we'll perish with the world. Paul is telling us here, we, we cannot love the world and love God. If we love the world, you know what happens when you love something? Is you become conformed to that thing. And so as we have our affection set on the world, we become more like the world. Well, we need to distance our hearts from the world. We need to take our eyes off the world, stop conforming to the world. And secondly, we need to place our eyes on Christ and love Him and let let him, let that love that he has for us and that love that we have for him transform us or change us into his image. Again, we become like that which we love and admire. We need to love and admire Christ. So how do we do that? Paul says through the renewing of our minds. And the only way we can do that, is, again, is to cut off the world and be in his word and be in prayer. And again, behold the glory of the Lord. Remember the secret Dr. Reeves gave us, I think it bears repeating. Dr. Sibbs said, the secret to sanctification is in 2 Corinthians 3, but we all beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one level of glory to the next. How do you behold the glory of God? Well, through his word, through prayer, through worship, that's how we fix our eyes on him and on his glory. Now, Paul says if we do this, if we renew our minds, if we fix our eyes on Christ, we will know His will. Sometimes Christians struggle with knowing the will of God, but it's actually quite simple. The things that are most important, and that is how He wants us to live. Well, by focusing on Christ, that's how we learn. We learn what's good. We learn what's acceptable. We learn what is perfect in His eyes. And of course, loving Christ, we will do it. And as far as the other things that the Bible doesn't contain, such as, you know, what does God want me to do in his providence? Should I marry this person or that person if I'm still unmarried? Or should I uh, take this job or that job? Should I have this house or that house? Should I live here or there? Those are things which the Lord will show us in, in his providence. And again, if we are focusing on him, he will show us. Now, this, this evening, Dr. Reeves is going to remind us that this is really what the Reformation was all about the Word of God, focusing on the gospel, focusing on who God is, focusing on what He wants us to do and trying to become as conformed to that as possible. So that, that's going to be a very uh, important encouragement, and it's one we need to see here. 
Because this is how we know the will of God. This is how we gain the power to be living sacrifices to the Lord. Now from this point, Paul descends into specifics. What is he talking about? What is this worship? What is this love we are to return to God? What is this service that we are to offer to Him? And in our text, Paul gives us three things. First of all, know your gift and use it to build up the body. Secondly, use the gift that He's given to all of us, love, to encourage and build up the body. And then thirdly, love also your enemies. Okay, that's what it means to worship God. That's, by the way, did Christ do those things? Yes, He did. And it's all about becoming like Him. First of all, He says we need to know our gifts and use them for His glory. We need to know that the Lord has not left us, you know, uh, left us to our own abilities to serve Him. He's not only given us His Spirit... He has also given us tools to work with. He has given to us spiritual gifts. But before Paul lists them, he first deals with a problem that he knows and we know that they can create, and that is pride. He deals with this also in 1 Corinthians, and he says, you know, because I'm, I'm not a mouth, but maybe I'm a foot <laughs> or a hand or something like that, therefore I'm not important. But that, that isn't true. All the different parts are important. But for those that might think that they have greater gifts, they need to be careful not to become prideful. If the Lord gives us one of the more public gifts, if He blesses our ability to use that gift, or if He uses our gifts to help other people and they express their appreciation to us, oh, I'm so thankful for you. You know, sometimes those things can create pride. And Paul warns us against that, not to become conceited, because remember where the ability actually came from. It came from the Lord. And so if we use His gifts and we get praise for it, we need to give it to Him. We need to make sure they understand that He is the one who gets the glory. And that's when we, we talk about giving glory to God, we simply mean giving Him the credit or the honor for the thing which was done. Now, secondly, we need to remember, Paul says, why God gave them to the church to benefit it. Just as our bodies have several different parts, and we need all of those parts. You know, we usually think of just the external parts, but think about the internal parts. We need them all for our bodies to function properly and to be healthy. He says, in the same way, we are all a part of the body of Christ and have been given a role in the body to make the whole body healthy and strong. Now, each of us has at least one gift. Some of us have more than one gift, but that we, we are to use that gift for the good of each other to help each of us grow into Christ's image so that we might better be able to do His work in the world. That's also one of the reasons why if, if one of our members isn't present, we all suffer because we need their gift. God has put in this body the gifts that he knows that we need. And what Paul is telling us here is that we need to use that gift in order to benefit one another. Now, let's consider each of them briefly, okay? Paul, first of all, mentions prophecy. And I don't think he means here telling the future. I think he's talking about preaching, okay? Now, if you look carefully at, at this list, and this is one of the two places in the Bible where you have lists, I think, well, two main places, where you have lists of spiritual gifts. If you look at this list carefully, you'll notice some fairly significant omissions, things that are missing, okay? When you compare it with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, okay, the charismatic gifts, okay, they're all missing. What's the difference? Well, the charismatic gifts are revelatory gifts, these are not. Okay, those that he speaks of in 1 Corinthians, the charismatic gifts are the gifts of the wisdom, knowledge, faith, faith to do miracles, healings, miracles, distinguishing of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Okay, none of that is present, which seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Why doesn't he mention those? Well, it could be because Paul was writing with an eye 
to how the church was going to function after the charismatic gifts would end. And we do believe that they have come to an end. The revelatory gifts, we believe that they ended when the Bible was completed. That's what we believe Paul is arguing at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. So what would remain after the charismatic gifts are gone? Are there any gifts left? Well, yes, there are. These gifts, which are gifts of service. Okay, again, what is the spiritual service of worship God desires from each one of us? Use your service gift to be a blessing to one another. So what are those gifts? Well, uh, the first one, again, is prophecy, which, as I've said, the word is used not just to refer to foretelling, the future. It also has to do with forth telling or proclaiming or declaring God's word. Now that is a service gift, the second part, and that's something we still need. It's more than just a natural ability to speak. It is the ability to speak in God's power with the result that the people of God are built up in their faith. Now, I'm going to, again, just deal with these briefly because there's so many of them. Secondly, he mentions the gift of service, okay? The ability to come alongside someone, to help them, to, to do something that they need, you know, to, some service they need. Now, any of us can do this. Any of us can serve other people if we have a heart to do it, and that's what we're called to do. Right? I mean, actually, the one who is the greatest in God's kingdom is the one who humbles himself and becomes the servant of all. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He is talking about a gift that includes, as it were, a greater willingness to become a servant and effectiveness to help other people, a compulsion to do this in a way that blesses other people. I think we all know, you know, people that are like that, that are always willing to lend a hand and help us do things that, you know, we need help with. And, and not just physical things, but spiritual things as well. Third, there's the gift of teaching, the ability to explain the truth, God's Word, and to refute error. Now, this is the gift that I think most believers want. Everybody seems to want to be a teacher in God's church. But it's the one that the Lord most strongly warns us about not against, but about. James 3, 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Okay, words are very powerful. And, you know, saying that you're speaking God's truth and when you're in fact saying something that's an error, that, that's a pretty serious thing because it, it injures the people you're, you're speaking with, doesn't it? I mean, you may be doing it in sincerity, but you can still be wrong. Now, this is one of the reasons why when it comes to public teaching, the Lord has entrusted that to the elders of his, of, of his church. One of the qualifications for an elder is that they have to be skillful in teaching the Word of God. There's a certain authority that comes with teaching, and that's why it's entrusted, especially public teaching, you know, when, when one person is teaching a group, okay? That's why it's entrusted to the elders and why they have to, again, demonstrate that they can do this, that they know God's truth, and they're able to explain it clearly before they can be ordained to office. But realizing that we also have a one-on-one -on -one responsibility to encourage and, and instruct and teach, like Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos, uh, we need to be careful as we help disciple one another or young believers that we don't go beyond what we actually know to be the truth. Okay, we, we need to be careful here. But again, one who has this gift has the ability to open the truth up and make it understandable, uh, make it clear. Next, exhorting. The gift to be able to encourage others to be faithful to the Lord. Now again, we're all supposed to encourage one another, but this is the ability to be able effectively to come alongside others and help them press forward through difficulties. We all need encouragement. There are some people who are just very encouraging. I think I found Dr. Reeves to be very encouraging. He has that gift. Well, if we have that gift, we need to encourage one another. And even if we don't, we still need to do that. Next, he talks about giving. And again, we're all called to give. We all, we're all called to 
help one another in need. We're all called to give to the Lord's work. But there are some who have a heart to use what God has given them to support the church and to help those in need who are the first ones to step up and do it. You know, there, there are some of us who are more reluctant and others of us that are more forward with it, and those of us who are more forward with it have more of a gift. We have the gift to do it. And so, again, all these gifts, by the way, are things that we're encouraged to use. Then leading, the ability to provide examples to others. It's not the ability to command, because even our Lord Jesus himself, when he was instructing the disciples and telling them what to do, he always went before them. You know, it's the example, the ability to provide that example, to lead others. And finally, he lists mercy, the ability to show kindness to those who are in need. And again, we're all, sh we're all called to show mercy. We're all called to be the Good Samaritan to the wounded Jew, so to speak, to be able even to, to love and help our enemies. But these are the ones whose hearts just go out to people who are in need. They sense that mercy. They're compelled to show mercy and to visit those who are in distress to help them. Now, again, notice that none of these gifts are revelatory, unless, of course, you take prophecy to be such. These are all service-oriented gifts. And as the Lord has given to each of us one of these gifts, and we all have at least one, Paul says we are to use them diligently according to the grace given to us, the abilities that he's given to us. We are to use this gift to serve the body for its growth in grace. Now, in order to do that, the second part that he now moves into is also very important. And that is that we exercise the gift that he has given to each one of us. And that is the gift of love that we are to use to build up one another. Love is, you see, love is that, that desire, that affection, that compulsion in each one of us that is going to move us to do something with what we have. If we don't have love, you know, the one who loves much, you know, is, is going to be thankful much and serve much, but the one who loves little is going to do little. That, that's what Jesus told the woman who was washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. She had been forgiven much. She loved much. She did much. So love is that which will compel us to do what the Lord calls us to do. And secondly, that's what Paul tells us to do. Love one another and let that love drive you to, to build up one another. Now, he says this love is to be genuine. It can't be hypocritical. It has to be from the heart. It cannot be just an act. When he says that we need love, and he goes on in verse 9 to, to talk about how, um, you know, we are to hate evil and hold fast to everything that's good, he's simply telling us what love does. Love, if we truly love the Lord, if we truly love his ways, we are going to abhor or hate a hypocritical love. And we're going to hold fast to that which is good, which is, of course, a holy and genuine love. So Paul says, let that love be genuine. Then he says, in that love, devote yourselves to each other. Love each other as members of the same family, because we really are members of the same family. We're, we're brethren. We're members of the same body. But think about it in terms of family. Okay, if we're members of the same family, as long as our example of family is a good example, and our families get along and we love each other, that's the example that we need to see here. That we need to love each other in this way which means that we're really going to want to have to do more with each other than just what we have to do with each other on this day. But throughout the week, you know, reach out to each other, care for each other, call each other, see how each other's doing, try to encourage each other. That, that's how the body builds itself up. He says, give preference to each other in honor. And what he means by this is instead of trying to be better than everyone else, because of your superior gifts, your superior intellect, your superior knowledge and accomplishments. Instead, draw attention to each other's gifts and each other's accomplishments, giving God glory for the things that you have done. You know, that, that encourages us when that happens, but it also gives us the opportunity 
to worship God. Try to outdo one another, Paul here is saying, in showing honor to each other, not drawing attention to yourself, but rather giving it to other people. He says we need to work hard at this, doing it from a heart that is filled with the Spirit's love, knowing that when we do this, we're really serving the Lord. By the way, I'm in verse 11 right now. And as we do this, to look ahead in verse 12 and rejoice in the hope that God is going to use our efforts to bless each other so that we all may be a witness to the world and a blessing to those who are outside the church. He says we're to continue to press forward when things get difficult, you know, persevering in tribulation in verse 12. And, you know, I don't, it, it, it's hard to tell whether Paul is mixing things that we should be doing here versus things that are going to happen to us out here. But he does mention tribulation twice, actually, and uh, how we should respond to it. And he does talk about this in, in a group of things that have to do with the church. So I think what he's telling us here is that we need to continue to press forward when things get difficult in the church. Now, we know that, that unbelievers are going to hate us, though we love them. But sadly, believers can hate us as well. And I know that to be true. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But he says we need to persevere through these difficulties, and love will enable us to do it. We need to devote ourselves to pray for each other. I don't think I need to explain that. But Paul is saying we need to do it, each of us, for one another, continually pray throughout the week for ourselves, but also for each other, that God would bless us and build us up and fill us with that love. We need to contribute to each other's needs. Um, we've already talked about that under the gift of giving, but be like the early church. Even though some have the gift to do this, we all need to be engaged in it. Not everybody who helped necessarily had that gift, but I'll tell you what, the people who sold their property and, and most of what they had to contribute to the needs of those who remained in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost and after the, you know, there was so many thousands of people that were saved. They needed to be discipled. Who was going to support them? Well, God's people, those who had the gift of giving, did that, but we all need to play a part in that, contributing to the needs and even providing meals and lodging as the Lord gives us opportunity, as He gives us ability, to brothers and sisters who may be traveling and in need of our help. I remember the early motels, hotels, inns were really decrepit places, not great places to stay, and so early Christians would open up their houses to those traveling evangelists and so forth to help meet their needs. Today we have modern hotels, motels. Some of them are pretty decrepit, but uh, the need isn't as great, okay? So we may not have to do this, but sometimes it's a blessing, you know, to be able to do this for brothers and sisters who need our help. Paul says, and again, thinking about Christians, bless those who curse you and do not curse in return. Again, we might think this applies to those outside the church, it certainly does. But in context, he seems to be referring to those inside the church. And yes, again, it can happen. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are to enter into one another's joys and sorrows. And of course, we can't help but do this if we love each other. And we see each other as members of the same family. And then lastly, in this point, he says, don't discriminate. You know, don't see yourself as better or wiser than anyone else, but be willing to spend time with the most lowly, the most poor, the most downcast, the most foolish who may be in the, in the congregation or those we might perceive to be that way. We need to treat everyone the same and love everyone. Love everyone who is a member of the body of Christ. So he says, you know, recognize your gift, use your gift, use it in love to build up the brethren. And then finally... He says we're not only to love those in the church, but those who are outside the church. And again, this is the most difficult thing the Lord calls us to do. Love your enemy. Now, first of all, he says love them by not retaliating. If someone treats us badly, we're not to return the same to them. Especially, he says in verse 17, when other people are watching. Because you're representing Christ. 
We are to pursue peace with everyone. Okay? That is our obligation. That is our duty. That's all we need to be thinking about. Try to make peace. Verse 19, if there is vengeance or retribution to be taken, God is the one who will take it. So what are we supposed to do to maintain peace? Well, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he doesn't repent, God's going to deal with it. How is he going to deal with it? Verse 20, heap fiery coals of judgment on his head. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. Not giving him a nice warm bucket of coals that he can carry to warm his own house, start his own fire. That's how some interpret this. But this is bringing down God's judgment. God is the one who is going to right all the wrongs. We do not have to concern ourselves with it. But the point is this, knowing that God will right all wrongs. Either through the cross, Jesus will either have paid for that if they trust him, or by sending fiery judgment on their heads, which I think he's talking about hell. Okay, he's going to right those wrongs. That makes it easier for us to show mercy because nobody's getting away with anything, right? Justice is served either way. We don't have to dish it out. God is the one who is going to do it. He's either dishing it out on Christ or he's going to dish it out on them. But we are not to dish it out on them. Okay. That makes it easy. Everything balanced, the scales are going to be balanced, you know, so to speak. Those that get the fiery coals on their heads, those scales will never be balanced. That's why it goes on and on forever. But that's the only way that God can deal with it, and he will deal with it. So Paul's conclusion is simply this. Do not be overcome by evil. Do not let yourself become embittered so that you return, you know, evil for evil. But overcome evil with good. Show them the kindness that God calls you to show them. He calls us to show everyone. So again, this is part of what it means to offer ourselves as living and holy sacrifices. Holy meaning entirely set apart for God's glory. A sacrifice meaning we are giving up our lives to serve Him. It means use your gift to serve one another. It means love one another, show honor to one another, be a family. And it means love even your enemy outside the church. Well, there is more to come, but that's all we're going to look at for this morning. Let's bow and pray that God would help us to be able, by His grace, to do these things. We have His Spirit. We have that ability. Let's pray He'll strengthen that desire by strengthening our love for him.